with us in the Biostock studio to provide expert insights on partnering and deal making is Viktor Sivic, who is Chief Financial Officer at iLab Therapeutics. The company develops treatments for disorders of the brain, mainly focusing on Parkinson's disease. Less than a year ago, Victor played a key role in negotiating one of the largest licensing deals in the Swedish biopharma space in decades, when he and the team at iLab Therapeutics outlicensed a drug candidate to major French biopharma company Ipsen at a total deal value of 363 million US dollars. Victor, it's a pleasure to welcome you today. Thank you, it's nice being here. Um, can I start by asking you to list the three key success factors for landing the IRLAB licensing deal in 2021? Of course. Uh, well, the first and foremost is, of course, that the project that itself has to be a really good and high quality project. And with Mistopetam, uh, which is a drug developed for treatment of LIDs, which is a sort of dyskinesias or uh, uncontrolled movements uh, often shown in uh, Parkinson patients. Uh, and it can also be expanded to psychosis in Parkinson's and uh, tardiv dyskinesias have, uh, is also a, an indication that it can be used for. Uh, this drug, we have excellent data both when it comes to efficacy and safety and tolerability and, uh, and the data package as such from the preclinical studies up until the phase 2a studies that we have made uh, are really, really good and solid. So that's the first thing that we, uh, that is a success, for us, success factor, I would say. Uh, then we were lucky enough or prepared enough to be able to have uh, a lineup of, of uh, potential licensees uh, where we had competition in, in the process. So we had several uh, companies that uh, came in with bids and that is of course also a really good, uh, a good thing to have. Uh, which we struggled for, of course, but uh, we were able to have that. So that is the second one. And the third one is maybe not so, uh, so obvious, but we have, since a long time ago, we have, we have worked with a financial strategy where we have made sure that our company or our lab looks strong in the eyes of the licensees. That means that we can have a much better uh, negotiation power in the negotiations and in the deals. And we can also be, a, we will also be able to sort of relax in the process and make the right decisions based on how the deal actually looks and what the interest really is, uh, instead of being um, stressed out by, by having to close a deal before this and that date and so on. So that is also a really important thing that uh, is a success factor, I would say, in, um, to make this happen. A majority of small biotech companies have a virtual organization, uh, mainly built on consultancies. Uh, but uh, Arlab Therapeutics has its own R&D team. Uh, how much did that uh, affect the, the discussions and the process in your licensing deal with Ipsen? I would say that that was a key ingredient in the process and something that really mattered when it came to closing the deal. Um, having our own research and development department is, is, has, has proven really, really uh, good for us. For example, um, the level of commitment and the, and the personal engagement you get as an employee is, with all due respect, different from being a consultant. Uh, we also have, for example, in, in the due diligence process, which was quite extensive, uh, then we can just walk 10 meters down the hall to get the answer from the, the research scientist that actually made, uh, made the science where the, action, where the question comes, uh, where Ipsen in this case had the questions. So that means that we can have, uh, very fast can have correct and good answers to basically any question they have. Um, it also means that we can control the quality of our research and we can also prepare the whole organization uh, on what will happen in the due diligence process. And as we can an anticipate 
basically the, the questions that will come or the areas and at least we can also prepare the, the organization to be able to answer those questions as good as possible. And I'm not sure that, would, that we would be able to have that kind of preparedness and agility with consultants instead of our own research um, department. So um, they are absolutely key. When you have a business model uh, mainly built on finding a partner at some point in development, uh, in terms of preparations, how far in advance should you start to identify and subsequently also approach potential takers of your asset? The answer is, uh, well, you can answer in different ways. Uh, and I will try to answer in a few ways. <laughs> um, from the beginning, or actually before Ireland Lab was even founded in early 2013 or late 2012, the management went to the JP Morgan uh, conference or the biotech uh, showcase conference in San Francisco to give information to potential future licensees uh, regarding the project we had at the time. And since then, we have consistently been on each and every BioEurope, BioUS, uh, JP Morgan, and all those other partnering conferences. Just being there, telling companies out there uh, about our projects, educate them about what we're doing, telling them what our next step will be, coming back a year later and saying, now we did that, as we, t as we told you we would do, we did it, and now we're going to do this. And not talking about deals, not being there with a price tag or not saying if you're interested, please give us a call. Just, just informing them about our projects. So I think that we are closing up to about 100 companies that we've been in contact with during these nine years. Um, and then when the time comes and we, can, and, and we deem that, the, uh, that we have the right circumstances to be able to, to do a successful process, then we sort of ring the bell and contact the ones that we know are most interested in our projects. So then we can, then we, and then we start to have a, a, a good process or a, uh, a streamlined process, so to speak, with, a, with this competition and, and so on. And uh, we rang the bell in, I would say, November, December in 2020. And then we started the, uh, uh, of course, there is a lot of NDA discussions and, uh, uh, and so on in the beginning. And then we uh, started really discussions in maybe January, February. And then uh, due diligence started mm, in, let's say, March, something like that, and went on for, for a few months. And just as on, uh, a side discussion there, we had, about 6,000 documents in our data room just regarding this, uh, this project. And Ibsen had, I think it was a bit more than 60 employees that were in our data room looking at their expertise areas and asking us questions on all the documents. So going back to the importance of having researchers, I mean, when a small organization like ours with 30 employees or maybe 25 at the time are uh, exposed to a big pharma company, 60 persons or 60 experts asking questions, then we really need to be on our toes to be able to, to, be able to respond uh, in a proper manner. So that's important, but it also takes time and you have to really respect that. And then the, uh, uh, I would say the, the negotiations on the, on the agreement as such, uh, that was maybe May, June, something like that. Uh, it takes quite a while. I mean, it is $363 million is quite a respect. It's, an, it's a big number. Uh, so it, we shouldn't take that easy. So it takes, takes some time. Uh, and then the final stretch in July, and we closed in uh, on the evening of the 15th of July, I think. So as I said, you could say that it took nine years. Uh, because that's when we started to talk to anyone. Uh, but you can also say that it took about seven months of quite intense uh, discussions and contacts. Our lab's licensing deal uh, had a total deal value 
of 363 million US dollars, in addition to potential royalties of sales, of course. Uh, the upfront payment was 28 million dollars. Uh, could you walk us through briefly uh, how this specific deal structure was uh, negotiated? Well, the deal structure is such, I mean, uh, the deals I've seen, they don't differ very much. Uh, you get you get milestones in phase transitions and at the entry market entry and that kind of events. We haven't disclosed and will not disclose uh, the exact timings or the exact amounts, but that's generally how it is. So that is sort of a given. Uh, then, of course, uh, well, what we have found is that. Uh, when you look at the net present value of a, of a deal, um, you, you have to build a marketing model. Now I get a bit, you know, taking a step backwards. You have to build a marketing model, uh, predicting how the how the product will sell, and then you and then you have the cost, of course, for the development, um, and then you get a net present value of that. And as a rule of thumb, you could say that the licensor and the licensee actually split that in the middle. So that means that if you take more money in the beginning, then you will have to give up even more money in the end because that is discounted, of course. So, um, and it also always gets to about 50%. So, uh, so what we need to do is to first talk to, um, talk to, uh, to the uh, licensee about how the marketing model or what we think about the future and then agree on how that looks. And then we know, sort of know the, the back, or the, the, the playing grounds. And with that already on, on the table, you can start discussing the, the, the amounts in the different upfronts and the different milestones and the, uh, how much should be regulatory milestones and how much should be commercial milestones and, and so on. So that's how it came down to the structure, so to speak. And then for our lab, we always uh, think that, I mean, the first and foremost thing that we need to focus on is our research and the quality of projects, our data and all that. But that is sort of a given. And that is a, that is a big risk in this, uh, in this industry, as we all know. However, the returns are also big, or the potential returns. So that's, that's why, we love, why we love this business or this industry. Uh, but uh, we also need to think about the financial risks and we need to manage the financial risks in a way so that, that we don't stumble on the financials if the, the science is good. So for us, it's, uh, having a good structure also means that we are able to manage the risks so that we get, got this quite substantial upfront payment that was important for us and also have um, have a, quite a big number at total uh, as a market uh, total deal value that was also important for us. Um, and then there's negotiating, and the end in the end it always comes down to haggling, the last dollars. Yeah, so basically that's how it how it happened. Many small companies. Uh want to partner or out-license an asset, uh, but far from all are as successful in doing that as our lab was. Uh, from an investor perspective, how do you spot the ones, the companies, who are most likely to strike a deal, you think? This is a difficult question because uh, I think that at least in the Swedish market, which is quite small, uh, the licensing deals are I wouldn't say black swans because you know that they are they are out there, uh, but they are very very rare. Uh, it doesn't happen very often or quite seldom actually. So that means that you, it's it's difficult to uh, take a data driven analysis of what's good and what's bad. Um, uh, so I would say I would like to go back to when, when we talked about this, what was most important for us. And of course, the quality of the project is, is important. Uh, for us, it's been important to have these discussions over a long time with potential licensees, um, to have them ready, so to speak, when we actually push the button and, and uh, uh, try to do, to, to, do, uh, to do the deal. Um, 
and also to make sure that you're financially stable all the time and, and make sure that you're not dependent on actually m m striking a license deal because it's not very easy to do it and, uh, and uh, the stars really have to be aligned um, to be able to do it. If licensing deals are a black swan, at least in the Swedish biotech space, how likely would you say that it is that our lab will do another one? Seeing as you, you weren't a one-trick pony, but you have more interesting assets in your pipeline. Yeah, I mean, that's why I think our lab is such an inter interesting company, because we have a whole stable of ponies in, uh, <laughs> at, back in our backyard. Uh, but, um, I mean, we know how to do it. Uh, we've made sure that we have the financial stability to not be able. We don't. We don't have any any pressure that we need to do it. Uh, we have Pirepamot, which is in phase two B, which started this Q1. We have a bunch of preclinical projects uh, going forward, and all of these could be interested interesting for a license for a partner. Um, so we have all the all the pieces in the puzzle are there, and uh, time will tell. And you have a track record. Yes, we have. Thank you so much for coming here to talk to us today, Victor. Thank you. My pleasure.